Emma from the Detroit Health Department. Um, today we will have um, Felix presenting first, and then Jabari okay. will be so, presenting um, after. We don't do the um, and um, we would like to ask you respectfully to save all of your questions for both presentations until the very end. So Felix will start us off today, and then Jupari will present afterwards, and then we will have a Q&A after both presentations. So Jupari, thank you very much for joining us, and welcome. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Felix Hill. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Portia. Um, I'm uh, the Behavioral Health Manager for uh, CDCF um, with uh, Detroit um, Health Department. and. Um, Glad to have the opportunity to be here with you all on this morning. Um, we're going to share the screen and I'll get the presentation started. Okay, so I'll be presenting on men, uh, mental health and the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the effects of that. And uh, Japari will be following up with uh, COVID vaccines and pregnancy and fertility and women's health. Men in COVID-19, um, often in this climate, um, our society has a value for men's contributions um, and they can be overshadowed and overlooked um, uh, with the climate that we, we live in. And so uh, there are many ways that men matter in the lives of their children and their wives and significant others and their family as a whole. Uh, but during this pandemic, it has become very stressful, um, very uncertain and unexpected. Um, and some of the effects of this pandemic have touched our finances, our ability to be able to provide for our families um, and the ones we care about, juggling employment, um, and has it, its effects on our relationships, uh, both our personal relationships and those extended ones outside of our home. Um, for some, ad adapting to this pandemic has been an experience that's been very, very overwhelming. So what you will learn today, the link between COVID-19, mental health and men, uh, stress management, um, what to do, and uh, uh, we'll round it out with some resources for you. Men, COVID-19 and mental health. So the three uh, areas I wanna touch on very quickly are men and mental health, uh, effects on provision, um, and signs of mental health and stress issues. So men are experiencing trauma and mental health issues for many different reasons during the COVID-19 pandemic. These include one, anxiety, uh, deal with a lot of worry and a lot of stress. A lot of times uh, when men are uh, dealing with issues, uh, it manifests itself in different ways uh, versus that of the way that it deals, uh, that it manifests itself uh, maybe in women. And so we do worry a lot. Uh, I can speak for myself, even in this pandemic, um, you, you're kind of concerned about the health of maybe your spouse and your children and even parents, if you're caring for those. Uh, separation from your friends and family, uh, especially those who became sick in an hospital. Um, I know all of us have uh, dealt with loss and grief during this pandemic and grief is not always um, the loss of just a person. Um, sometimes it's a loss of a job or a relationship, um, emotional stress um, of close living situations. Um, a lot of people were uh, in situations where they may have had multiple families in one household um, during this pandemic and not having the space that was needed for you to have your own space and your own privacy that you were used to. Um, finding care for children out, out of school. Um, everyone had to kind of adjust to virtual learning um, and that was a stressor within itself. But when you're juggling that and trying to maintain your employment, uh, whether you're remote or in person, um, you have to make sure that you know, your, your children are taken care of during the day. Um, financial stresses, <coughs> lost jobs, um, and uh, had healthcare costs as a result, and then some ongoing difficulty, difficulties accessing uh, healthcare services. Uh, overall, the stress of making decisions about this vaccination um, and vaccines that they've as they presented themselves um, and for our families um, 
is stressful within itself, trying to uh, sift through all of the information and make an informed decision uh, for the sake of you and your families. Effects on provision. Um, one of the things uh, as a male, uh, the joys that come along with operating in manhood are that when there's a problem, I fix it. When there is danger, I protect it. And when there is a need, I supply it. Um, when COVID-19 uh, arrived, as a man, you wanted to fix it. You wanted to protect it uh, uh, from the loved ones, uh, when you protect your loved ones from it. And if there was any need that arose, as a result of this pandemic, you wanted to be in a position to supply those needs. And for a lot of men, um, this affected, this area was affected. I was not able to fix it because I didn't know its origination, or the origin of it. Um, we've kind of been fighting an invisible enemy. And so I wasn't necessarily able to protect anybody from it besides us quarantining ourselves. And then if there was a need and it affected my finances or uh, my income, uh, I wasn't in a position to supply it. And so this alone has its effect on our mental health. Uh, effects on the provisions continue. Um, some bullet points, men make up about 47.13% of the population in Detroit. Um, financial barriers, loss of uh, childcare and health concerns is challenging for all families. Um, there are three main groups of workers that were in the COVID-19 economy. Those who have uh, lost their jobs, those who are classified as essential workers, those who are able to continue working from home. And 85% of the city of uh, Detroit's population consists of Black and Latino Americans. Uh, most workers of color have suffered record numbers of uh, job losses since the start of this pandemic, along with the ensuing related uh, economic devastation. Blacks and Latinos are disproportionately found among the essential workers in the economy. Um, and during this pandemic, they continue to go um, to their workplaces, uh, risking their health and that of their families because of their, uh, their being unable to sustain adequate social distance with co coworkers and customers. Uh, some of the effects. Why is this challenging to you as a provider? Because as a male and as a provider, uh, you're an essential worker. I run the risk of putting my family self in danger, but staying at home unemployed takes away from me being able to provide for my family. And again, as men, we want to fix it, we want to protect it, and we want to supply it. What are some signs of mental health and stress issues? Uh, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. Um, during this pandemic, I even found myself sleeping a whole lot. Uh, and some people in my family may have blamed it on the fact that I was having another child um, and I was having symptoms, but that wasn't the case. <laughs> but I was sleeping a lot uh, during the pandemic and all the days were kind of running together because you were just stuck at home, uh, feeling unsafe or anxious, um, worried about not only your safety, but those of your family members. Uh, increased use of alcohol, tobacco, and substance use. We have saw uh, on the rise during this pandemic, not just with men, but with individuals across the board, especially those who deal with that as a struggle. Um, strained relationships with family members, um, irritability and blaming others. Uh, being in one place, uh, I think everybody can speak to this. If you're in one space for too long around the same people every day, you have the tendency to get irritated <laughs> and if the monotony is not breaking up. And so uh, uh, irritability and blaming others and blaming others for what, what's going on around you, even though it might not have anything to do with them. Uh, lack of energy, very tired, um, and aches and pains um, that may not be able to explain, but they, they're a result of stress um, during this pandemic. And so how do we manage the stress? Pandemic fatigue versus depression and anxiety. Sometimes with pandemic fatigue, um, it can look a lot like depression and anxiety, um, especially for those with pre-existing depression or anxiety, the pandemic can simply um, make those symptoms worse. It's not important. 
um, to label uh, it as pandemic fatigue or, and, and, or depression or anxiety, as much as uh, recognizing that some of the things that you do on a regular basis are becoming increasingly difficult um, to do. Uh, whether that's work, school, eating, cleaning, or even maintaining your own hygiene. Um, that's when you want to try to seek support when some of those things are becoming uh, more and more difficult. And then a professional may be able to help you label your experience um, to get you appropriate care. Everyone's symptoms are different. Um, if you're generally not feeling like yourself, then you may be one uh, maybe one of the first signs that you're experiencing some possible fatigue, depression, or anxiety. And so some of the common symptoms include um, feeling sad, um, tearfulness, uh, emptiness, or hopelessness, um, feelings of re restlessness, guilt, blaming yourself for what's going on around you, uh, anger or inability, we touched on that in a previous slide, withdrawing from things you used to enjoy. Um, a lot of people have just kind of shut down um, from even interacting with family members or simply exercising or wanting to take a walk, doing some of the, the hobbies and interests that they typically enjoy doing. They completely shut that down for the sake of uh, being stressed or worried about um, contracting this virus. Avoiding talking to friends and family um, and then changes in your sleep. We touched on that. Um, thoughts about harming yourself. Um, the rates of suicide have increasingly gone up because some people have lost everything. And there's so many different layers to this, um, but among men, um, it has been increasingly um, going up um, as a result of this pandemic and not being able uh, to again, provide or do some of the things that's needed to do um, that it feel like he needs to maintain. Um, changes in appetite or even weight, um, not wanting to eat, or overeating um, because of stress. And so how do I help myself and help others around me? One, you wanna recognize that these stressful, uh, these are stressful and usable uh, circumstances that risk for fatigue may be increased. And so what I'm saying is that with this pandemic, it's all new to all of us. And so every day is a new experience. We may be getting new mandates. We may be asked to adjust. And so because it's new to everyone, um, we have to be very sensitive to that and accept the fact um, that it's, it may be stressful and that the risk of fatigue may increase. Um, spot the signs and symptoms of fatigue within yourself, your spouse or uh, your children. Um, you wanna make sure that even if you're not recognizing the signs within yourself, you're recognizing it within those in your family. Um, and being able to address those um, is very important. Identify those things which you uh, do not have control over and do the best you can with the resources you have available to you. I always say do the best you can where you are with what you have. Um, it's okay. Um, if I don't have everything that I need, um, do the best with the resources that I do have. Having family, having shelter, having water, having food are the top essentials. And so we stress a lot about uh, some of the things materialistically that we may not be able to attain or, uh, uh, or retain, um, but we wanna make sure that we do the best with what we do have in our possession. Communicate with your uh, support network, your family or faith-based community. Communication is important. Um, a lot of us have had to be isolated, especially some of our seniors, but as men, we have the tendency to want to suppress uh, our anger, suppress our, uh, our, our hurt and our pain, and eventually it's kind of like a balloon. When you put so much air in it, we eventually snap, and uh, sometimes we snap on people who have nothing to do with the things that we have suppressed. And so it's important for us to communicate those things out and, and, and uh, assess them and be able to identify the origin of them. What do I do? Self-care during this COVID, and I'm not gonna go over all of these, um, but a few that I definitely want to uh, harp on is one, take a break from the news. The news and media and information will stress you within itself. Take a break, walk away from it <laughs> because 
you'll overload yourself in trying to sift through and process all of that is stressful within itself. And for a lot of us, um, as I've always said when I'm with Japari, uh, we can't account for YouTube scholars and Google students. And we can't really identify um, what are viable sources. Most people can't, what are viable sources of information for us to have the, the information that we need to go about. And so step away from all of that um, and just take a break from it. Uh, read a book, take a walk or something. Uh, one next to it, connect to nature. Um, separate from the things that you can't control. Um, take care of your body um, physically and be active. Um, one of the things that we've run into um, and as far as educating on the vaccine in particular is that when dealing with the vaccine, uh, if you don't take it and you have to uh, acknowledge the consequences of it. And please excuse me, I, I, know, I know you probably hear my baby crying in the background, <laughs> but, uh, but if you don't take it, um, you, have to, uh, you have to acknowledge that you're gonna have to keep your mask on. And then for some of us, we have to be more disciplined with our diets and what we eat so that we're able to fight off um, some of the things that might come and attack our bodies. Men in COVID-19 pandemic, I'll run through these very quickly. Uh, one, we wanna adjust our mindset, get support from others, remind yourself why you are confined to your home in the first place, practice gratitude on a daily basis with those you come in contact with, adjust your expectations on a day-to-day -day basis, and then reduce stress with a routine. I'll outline a routine for each day. And I stress in how important that may be for some people, especially us as men. Have a routine written out for your day and try to work your plan throughout the day. Give yourself more time than you actually need to complete tasks. Multitask if you are caring for someone other than yourself. Be flexible with your daily routine and uh, set some time to unwind at the end of your day. And then lastly, plan for rough days. Identify the root of the problems that uh, as they arise. Um, write a list of calming activities for yourself. Uh, practice um, breath technique, breathing techniques um, to calm yourself um, when rough days do come and ask friends and family for support if you need it. When do I seek professional help? You wanna ask yourself these questions. Am I having trouble functioning at home or in the community? Suffering from severe fear, anxiety, or depression? Symptoms making it difficult for you uh, to get along with other people? Uh, doing daily tasks and responsibilities are, are seem overwhelming? Is your concentration and ability to focus compromised? Emotionally numb and disconnected? Or are you using alcohol and drugs to make yourself feel better? And then to wrap up, these are some of the resources um, for any men or men that you may know that may be on the call. Um, one, you always have us, Detroit Health Department. And so we're always uh, at your beck and call. If you do need education or resources or support, we're always there. Uh, you have Detroit Wayne Integration um, Health Network, Employee Assistant Program, uh, Headspace for uh, all Michiganders, um, which have some great resources for mindful exercises and taking care of yourself. Michigan Stay Well Counseling via COVID-19 Outline. You will get free counseling um, and it's available at, from 24 hours a day and it's confidential and it's free. National Disaster Distress Helpline and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 24 seven. And so thank you all. Uh, we're definitely gonna switch gears now. Lord, uh, I hope that something was said or done um, that will help you all along the way. Um, next up is Ms. Japari, and I'll let her introduce herself to you all, um, but thank you all for the opportunity. Um, okay, go ahead, Portia. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you so much, Felix, Super Dad, 
He is taking care of an infant today um, on his own. And so we really appreciate him not only presenting, but staying so cool, calm, and collected. We really appreciate your time. Um, and now, Japari, take it away. All right. <laughs> Thank you again um, as, as well. Felix always brings um, great messaging for us. Um, even as someone that listens to his presentations, I always learn something new and I hope um, if any of you all have any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, if I'm unable to answer, I will definitely reach out to Felix and um, be sure that he's able to address your questions or concerns. Um, at this point, we are going to switch gears a little bit. Um, Felix did a wonderful job talking about men's health. However, we can't forget about our ladies. And so I'll be focusing on more of the physical, the body parts and um, women's health with COVID-19. So disclaimer, I do want to mention that even though I am a nurse, I am not an OBGYN nurse. Um, I, I enjoyed my semester in OB, but I'm an adult nurse and I focused on cardiac stuff. So that is my world. But um, I just want to let you all know that that's kind of what my background is. In case you have specific questions about um, OBGYN, women's health, I may have to seek uh, more expertise from various team members that can answer those questions. Uh, so of course, we do like to start the discussion with the current situation in our city. Um, as of the 27th, we have seen total over 51,000, we're near 52,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and uh, 2,300 um, confirmed deaths. And while this number we, we know is from the beginning of the pandemic till the 27th, um, we've recently been seeing an uptick um, of the cases and as well as confirmed deaths due to this disease. Uh, the right side of the screen has our positivity, positivity rate map. You are all familiar with this information. Um, this just shows the positive cases or positive tests that are coming back, the percentage of it. And I do want to mention that about a month ago, we were down at less than 1%. Um, so you can see that even though it is low, we are still um, going up gradually. This is perhaps more than likely due to the variant um, that, that we know as the Delta variant uh, in, the, in the community, in the state. And we anticipate that more and more tests might be coming back with this Delta variant. Um, so, oops, I apologize. I did not mean to end my presentation. Um, this is just the uh, vaccination dashboard goes over percentages of vaccine, uh, people that have received at least one dose over the age of 12. Um, I last spoke with you all, we were probably at about 35%. We're at 39.5, right there near 40, um, which is a, a good number to be at compared to some parts of the country. However, if you see us um, with regards to the other communities, we're definitely on the lower side. Uh, so this is why we continue to provide information about the COVID-19 vaccines and encourage folks to, to seek the vaccine um, once they've made that decision. Um, you all are all familiar with the benefits of getting COVID-19 vaccines. We've talked about this many times. We know that it will prevent hospitalization and death. We know that people who do get vaccinated may have breakthrough cases. And we're seeing more of those, especially with the new Delta variant. However, the number of people that die from these cases um, that have been vaccinated are very few. It's a rare thing to happen. So um, the people that are mostly hospitalized for COVID-19, majority of them are people that are unvaccinated. And then we know that number two, the vaccine is gonna be the safer way to build protection. We know if we all decided to expose ourselves to COVID-19, we are at the mercy of our immune system. Some of us may do, may do fine and many of us might not do fine. Um, and we've seen that with the hundreds of thousands of people who have already died from the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, this is one tool that we have that will help us stop this pandemic. Um, I think I've mentioned probably in the past and many times that I, I'm looking forward to celebrating my wedding uh, with my friends and family. 
uh, when this pandemic is over. However, you know, it's it, it can't really happen until we're at a part, point in this pandemic where things are safe for friends, for families, but then everyone has a reason, you know, everyone's reason for wanting this pandemic to be over is different. Some people haven't seen um, loved ones or share time with loved ones. Uh, some people want to get back to traveling around and get back to going to concerts and things of that nature. And we are slowly getting there, but um, we still have a long ways to go. So real quick, we're just going to highlight the immune system because this is going to help us in our conversation today about women's health. We know, number one, our immune system is our natural defense system. We have many systems in our bodies. We have the respiratory system, cardiac system, immune system is basically your army, your navy, your air force, whichever one you choose it to be, your marines, it is that. Um, with immunity, that immunity is protection against the disease. So the goal is that if you are immune to a disease, you can be exposed to it without becoming infected. You're almost like invisible to that disease. And in today's conversation, we're going to highlight um, active immunity and passive immunity, the different types of immunity. Uh, we've talked in depth with active immunity. That's when we talked about the spike protein. We've talked about antigens and antibodies. Today's is really going to talk specifically about passive immunity. All right. So active immunity, that's when we get exposed to a germ, triggers our immune system and antibodies get produced. Um, the natural immunity route is what we know uh, people who are unvaccinated are, I don't want to say choosing, but that's the pathway that uh, they, they, are, they are going through. So they get exposed to the disease, the COVID-19, the SARS coronavirus 2 virus, and that triggers their immune system to build antibodies and fight back. Vaccine-induced immunity, that's for uh, the vaccinated people, they get exposed to a version of that germ. Um, in my case, the mRNA version, which was with Moderna. Others might have gotten uh, Johnson & Johnson. But basically, your immune system gets exposed and starts producing antibodies on its own. And your bodies will remember, your antibodies will remember, just like my little Game of Thrones um, thing there, uh, hashtag winter is coming. And that's kind of how active immunity is, and we're not gonna spend too much time on that today. Passive immunity is when antibodies are given to a person. So rather than the immune system make its own antibodies, the immune system is given antibodies. So there are, other, there are several ways you can have passive immunity. We'll talk about that in a second, but this is just one more slide about active immunity to remind you all that antigens exist. Those are on the germs and antibodies get produced and attack those germs. So here with passive immunity, there are several ways. We know that newborn babies get their antibodies from their mothers through the placenta. So a baby that is being developed, um, a fetus, is, is constantly getting nutrients um, from their mother through the placenta. And then during childbirth, they can get those antibodies as well. That is why mothers um, in their third trimester may get a tetanus vaccine or uh, may get another type of vaccine to help um, boost their immune system, but their baby might get some of those antibodies as well. And then mothers pass on antibodies through breastfeeding. This is one of the big things that um, lactation consultants and um, therapies, therapists tell women, breastfeed. If you can, if you're able to, and that is something that you are um, trying to do, work on breastfeeding your baby because you have antibodies that you can help that baby have to protect themselves. Um, and then the final way that uh, passive immunity is acquired is through monoclonal antibodies. So a person that might have had COVID-19 and recovered still has the antibodies that they got through active immunity. Um, they, they go to a, um, like a blood donation bank and they give those uh, antibodies through, you know, they get their blood drawn. Um, scientists and uh, the technicians, they pull out those antibodies and we use those antibodies to give them to people who might be a little bit sick, but not too sick. Um, 
to help them build their immunity. And I do want to mention with monoclonal antibodies, um, they're not technically emergency uh, approved by this, the FDA at this point. They also have the emergency use authorization that the vaccines have. But we've seen great improvement in giving it to patients who are, you know, contracting this disease, but not sick enough to end up in the hospital or, you know, on a ventilator. You kind of have to find a sweet spot um, when you're giving antibodies to a person to, you know, to make sure that you're giving it appropriately and not to someone that might not really even benefit from it. All right, so I do want to talk a little bit about a recent study that was done by Harvard, the University of Harvard, um, that showed vaccines protect mothers and their newborns. I was very happy to see this um, because when we first started discussing mothers and babies and vaccines, this was back in January and February. We didn't have a lot of information. But last, um, within the last two months, this research came out. It was published in the American Academy of Obstetricians, um, basically showing that pregnant women had a robust immune response to coronavirus vaccines and passed it on to their newborns, as we were discussing. Um, so we know that with the, the study was done with messenger, uh, the mRNA vaccines, and that was Pfizer and Moderna, and they were able to protect pregnant women as well as lactating or breastfeeding women. Um, in Vaccine-induced immune responses were significantly greater than the natural infection. Um, I will tell you, alongside with the fact that I'm not an OB nurse, I get very nervous when I'm taking care of an OB patient. And I'm sure my fellow non-OB nurses can say that as well, because you know, number one, you're not just taking care of one person, you're taking care of two. And then on top of that, OB patients, um, they can, they can, you know, get really sick very quickly and you, you're limited sometimes in the things that you can do for them. So OB patients or pregnant women that come to the hospital are on regular floors, um, are, they make us nervous <laughs> because we don't know if they can, you know, turn the side really quickly and that's not just affecting the mom, but also a baby as well. So that's just a side note, but I do want to also mention with this study, the immune transfer to neonates, uh, neonates occurred through placenta and breast milk, as we mentioned um, in the previous slide. So in regards to the women's health and who was studied in Pfizer and Moderna's uh, COVID-19 vaccine studies, um, about close to 50% of the participants were women. And the goal is that they will continue to monitor these participants for two years. So we know that participants received their first vaccines last fall. And so they're getting close to their one year and they've been, they, they have been followed during this time period and for another one year. Um, according to the developmental and reproductive toxicity studies, they found that um, there was no information that, sorry, the studies provided the first safety data to help inform the use of vaccines. Um, until there's more data. So this is because women are not, pregnant women are not um, of the first group to be studied in regards to um, studies with, uh, you know, medications or medical devices and treatments like that. They usually come afterwards and we'll discuss that in the next slide. Um, three of the leading women, um, women's health professional organizations came out at the beginning of this year and basically said that even though fertility was not the main focus of the study for COVID-19 vaccines, they hadn't seen any loss in fertility or any loss of children, um, loss of, you know, due to the vaccine. And then also there is no sign of infertility in the animal studies. So many of the um, OBGYNs that I listen to or follow regarding this information on women's health have said, you know, fertility is not really something that can happen. These vaccines don't enter the part of the cells that can change it or alter it, um, but rather they just stay in the cells enough to help produce immunity and antibodies. And then after, you know, 12 hours, a couple days, they're really taken apart in your, in your system. 
So now we're just going to talk about menstrual cycles and the COVID-19 vaccines. Well, one of the specialists that uh, I find very fascinating is Dr. Jordan Fifey. Um, he's an OBGYN, and this is some of the stuff that he said on in the article for uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Basically, with the immune system, um, and this is in response to many of the information coming out with menstrual cycles being changed, women complaining about um, feeling different after they received one or their second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And his response was that there are many factors that play that come to play and highlighting the immune system as well as stress. So we've talked a lot about the immune system and, and it's really important for us to grasp and understand that it, it plays a huge role in, in a lot of things, including reproductive systems. So for women, and, and you may know that Whenever a woman is about to start her menstrual cycle, um, to start to ovulate, I'm sorry, she, her immune system will build itself up. It will ramp itself up to prevent infectious agents from messing with the fertilization of that egg, messing with the implantation of that egg. So your immune system is very heightened. Um, once the egg is fertilized, the immune system kind of relaxes. It's gone in from high gear to like really low gear because it wants to make sure that the immune system does not cause a miscarriage or does not lead to an egg being um, pushed out of the system. So it relaxes a little bit. And that's why a lot of times pregnant women are high risk because their immune system is kind of, it, it's, it's on the radar because it, it doesn't want to be as robust and cause a miscarriage or push out that child um, or fetal, um, the, the fetus. Also, the lining of the uterus uh, actually has immune cells in it, and those immune cells can be affected by hormonal changes. Um, many women can attest to the fact that sometimes after their periods, they might experience a yeast infection or they might experience uh, bacterial vaginosis. These are normally in the uterus, in the um, reproductive area, these, these um, you know, these uh, fungal or feet of, yeah, the yeast are there, but when your immune system kind of lowers, these, these uh, you know, yeast can pretty much take over and start to become problematic. So a lot of times women may experience this, um, you know, yeast infection right after their period because their immune system has gone into, you know, relaxation for a minute and it's, it's time to take over. So when these uterine infections take place, it can also alter a woman's normal menstrual cycle. So that is one thing that uh, people need to consider with regards to changes in their menstrual cycle, especially after receiving a vaccine. Um, and then stress. Stress is like the root cause of almost all kinds of evil. And we know that emotional stress, physical stress, as well as chemical stress, can alter uh, the hormonal um, control center, which is in the hypothalamus, and can change a woman's uh, menstrual cycle. If anyone, does anyone, can anyone think of any um, examples of emotional stress or physical stress or chemical stress at this time? Abuse. Okay, yep. That can definitely alter a woman's uh, menstrual cycle. Um, another one can be, um, and I'm gonna put this here, grief. Grief is another one. Anxiety. With physical stress, extreme dieting or extreme exercising. And then with chemical stress, some medications can alter and cause you know, changes uh, and cause, cause the release of stress, depression as well. So these are just some of the examples of things that induce stress and then alter or change a woman's menstrual cycle. All right, here we're gonna briefly discuss um, one of the most common myths that has circulated for months and months now regarding COVID-19 and causing infertility. So for me, back in December, when these vaccines were about to become um, available, <laughs> I heard of this and I had to do my own research because as someone in the childbearing age, I really wanted to know, is it, is, is it able to do that or not? 
And when I dug a little bit, I found out where the source of this rumor came from. And it was back in December, the doctor who was part of the Pfizer studies, um, Wolfgang Woodrock, um, basically came out to the U European Medicine Agency and asked for a delay because of um, the Pfizer vaccine's approval because he was concerned that a protein that is found in the COVID-19 spike protein is, is gonna be the same protein that can be found in human placentas. Um, what, what the research shows is that these proteins are similar, but not at all the same. It is, they, are, they are as similar as um, two 10 digit phone numbers that you or I have, you know, my phone number starts with an eight, yours may start with a three. And because maybe you have a eight in your phone number, that's as similar as our phone numbers are. And that's as similar as these proteins um, might have been. So this was not true. And this doctor did come back and say, no, no, I was just trying to be precautious. It's not the case, please carry on. These vaccines are safe in women and do not affect their placentas. But by that time, we know that the rumors had already gotten out and were being, um, you know, circulating around social media and um, in conversations with, you know, family members and friends. Also, um, this movie that uh, came out, Utopia, on Amazon Prime, really is interesting. It kind of goes over um, <laughs> what we're currently dealing with, which is a pandemic, but there was more uh, conspiracy-based things going on with the in this movie related to pharmaceuticals uh, pushing out their medications. So moving on, I'm just going to go over um, one last thing that we've talked about, we need to talk about, which is Johnson and Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine, um, and this also is uh, related to women's health because we know that they had found a very rare blood clot. Um, problem with Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine, which is called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Basically, they found blood clots in uh, several individuals, and these blood clots could not be treated with the typical medication that we treat blood clots with. Um, heparin, for example, Lovenox, if, if you all might be familiar with them, because if they treated them with that blood clotting medication, it causes a bleed. So they weren't able to, they had blood clots, but they weren't able to um, have platelets that would prevent the clots from um, bleeding more and more. So this happened back in April. We know the CDC and the FDA put a hold on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This was affecting mainly women within childbearing ages. So this is women in their mid twenties, um, early twenties, I'm sorry, to 49, 50 years old. Um, they had participants, they had originally seen it in about 13 uh, cases, but it grew and I think at the end of this, um, when at the end of the um, investigation, it was about um, 20 something women that had actually suffered from this. And it is fatal, it's a very serious condition. However, it is very rare. Millions of people have taken the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, continue to take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It's just something to be aware of. And of course, there are vaccine, other options available um, in, in this country. As a matter of fact, we might be seeing another vaccine coming out um, by the fall time that is another different type. So my sister, for example, had taken the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. She is within that age group. I you know, told her, make sure you're keeping an eye on yourself for headaches or you know, sudden changes like loss in vision, kind of like maybe stroke-like symptoms. Keep an eye on that uh, for at least two weeks while you've taken this vaccine. And thankfully, she's been fine. However, you know, there were people that suffered from this and we you know, will continue to update information as we learn more about um, this uh, condition. Um, sorry, I, I know we're getting close to time here, but uh, with pregnant individuals, we know that the CDC continues to recommend pregnant women receive the COVID-19 vaccine. However, I always say, talk to your OBGYN first. They know your situation. So if you are discussing COVID-19 
to a family member, community member, loved one, just make sure that they have gotten some form of clearance from their OBGYN, who knows their situation, who knows their history best. And, um, you know, we don't want to give information. We also have to protect the individual and, you know, their fetal fetus because we don't know um, if that vaccine or condition might have some counter action and, you um, I, I, you know, as a nurse, I always have to protect the patient and go with the advice of their PCP or their OBGYN. Um, as mentioned, pregnancy is a medical condition, so women were not studied, pregnant women were not studied originally. However, Pfizer has been studying pregnant women and hopefully by the fall, we will have results from their studies knowing specifically um, COVID-19 vaccines in pregnant women. And they're going to continue to follow these pregnant women um, and their babies for up to six months. Um, this slide just goes over what we've talked about in the past, which is talk to your providers if you have allergies, have a fever, bleeding or clotting disorder, immunocompromised, um, pregnant or planning on becoming pregnant, are breastfeeding, or have had other COVID-19 vaccines. The main groups, and it's actually three groups of people, I would say that could not get the COVID-19 vaccine. Number one, children less than the age of 12 at this time um, cannot get the vaccine, any vaccine. And then if anyone has had a severe allergic reaction to a first dose or a previous dose of um, either COVID-19 vaccines, or if they're allergic to the ingredients in either of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we've talked about this before, but I just wanted to highlight uh, V-Safe specifically because this is something that I participated in um, and continue to participate in. It's the smartphone based tool that sends you text messages uh, asking how you're feeling, how you're doing. And I do want to mention they, all, they always ask if, um, if I'm pregnant uh, and that will basically indicate whether or not I can you know, be a part of a study or be, um, you know, look, review that for COVID-19 vaccines and it, its effects. But I recently completed my six month V-SAFE um, survey after receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. And um, I encourage anyone that might have gotten their vaccine yet and is thinking about getting it to, to a uh, health checker and it will pretty much ask you how you're doing and keep records of things. Um, finally, side effects. We know that there are possible side effects, of course, pain at the injection site, tiredness, headache, weakness, muscle joint ache, fever and chills, but always we remind people signs that your body is building protection against, um, against the disease. Um, with that, I think that's pretty much all the information I have. I do want to leave uh, enough time for questions, comments, and discussion. Um, I want to leave this here for now. Uh, Portia, are there any questions in the chat that I can address at this time? Yes. Thank you so much, Japari, for your presentation. As always, incredibly informative and helpful. And there was a question in the chat um, it was right after you first started, and it was in regards to a study that was done. Um, the chat says, how many women were included, and were there enough for the result to be statistically significant? So I'm not sure if you can remember exactly which study or if the person who asked this question would like to um, chime in and uh, remind us which study in particular. Do you know the one she's referring to, Japari? Uh, this might be the Harvard study, and I'll, let me try to find those slides um, real quick here so we can go back to that. But yes, there were um, several women in that study. Uh, I believe the total ended up being, um, if I can remember, with this Harvard study. Uh, let's see the slides here. I think in total, it was about 130 women that were Oops, I'm not sharing my screen, sorry. Um, that were included in this study, about 130 women, if that's the study we're, we're talking about. And, oops, apologies, um, folks, I'm trying to pull up the right slide here. Oops. 
Yes. Yeah, so basically they studied women that were either pregnant um, as well as women that were lactating. And then they studied women that were not pregnant or lactating and see they, they did blood draws to see how their immune responses were um, and provided the results based on that. Here we go. All right. Just want to say, is was that the study? Let's see. I'm not sure. I'm but not I sure either, but probably. Okay. Yeah. So it was about 130 women. I, I want to say about 80 something, 81 of them were pregnant women. Um, maybe 20 something in addition to that were uh, lactating women and the rest of them were non-pregnant women. And they they basically followed them for a period of time and then intermittently drawing their blood to see what their antibodies look like. Um, they started the study pre-first pre dose. Um, they drew blood again during their second dose. I want to say two weeks, four weeks after that, and then six months after, uh, no, not six months, sorry, a couple months after that um, initial study began to see what their antibody levels were. And that's how they were able to come up with um, the results showing that there was a robust immune response um, that was greater than with the natural infection. Okay, um, there's one other comment that says, uh, one of the CHWs has had a client tell her she's mixing breast milk and shakes for her toddler to help him become immune to COVID. Um, do you have any opinion on that? Um. <clears throat> I'm not sure about what kind of shakes she might be mixing with uh, for the toddler. Um, you know, I, I understand with, you know, in young children who, are, who cannot get the vaccines, it's really important to try to protect them, especially knowing that the Delta variant is uh, seeming to be more contagious or more infectious, but also targeting younger people as well. However, there is no current data that I have come across um, specifically about um, shakes or you know, other non-natural or non-breast milk um, you know, baby food or babies, baby product that, or young children product. Um, that would be something interesting that I would, I would love to hear what kind of shakes she's mixing them with. And then- I think, um, I think they're breast milk shakes. I think uh -huh. she's putting breast milk in the shakes to uh, help him okay. become immune. Okay, yeah. And you know what? I've heard that you can provide breast milk to, um, you know, toddlers, and that perhaps is helping. Um, that I would love, love to see the research and the information on that. Very interesting. <laughs> she's hiding it in vanilla shakes. What? <laughs> I got it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, great, thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions um, about the presentations today? And I think we just have a lot of thank yous, really great information. People appreciate um, this content so much, much, so thank you so much for your uh, participation. I'm going to share the link to complete uh, the survey to print your own certificates and then upload them to your profile in the registry. If you have any questions, you can always uh, text me or um, I'm sorry, email me at education at mishwa.org. I'm going to put that in the chat as well. And we will be recording this and then posting it in the registry as a recorded educational opportunity as well as on YouTube. So if you'd like to share this, just keep an eye out for that link um, on our YouTube channel. And, and if you've never been to our YouTube channel, go to YouTube type in Michigan Community Health Worker Alliance. We have our own channel, hit subscribe, and then you'll be notified every time we do upload something new. So if we offer a CEU opportunity at a time that you cannot make it, you can always just watch the um, recording instead. So if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank our guests one more time. Thank you to Felix and Japari. And um, I'd like to thank all of the community health workers for participating. If you'd like to unmute and turn your cameras on to say goodbye, um, we will do that at this time. And I will just see you guys at the next one. Thanks and have a great day, everyone. Bye. I'd also like to thank Nicole, our program specialist for helping to run the chat. Thanks.